Hallelujah. Can we celebrate Hallelujah. Jesus one more time? Can we Hallelujah. celebrate Jesus? Hallelujah. Celebrate Jesus. All about this beauty. Celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. I want you to preach to your neighbor. Say, neighbor. Neighbor. Today is a flawless victory. Today is a flawless victory. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible made us to understand. It said there was a strong man in the land of Philistine, terrifying the children of Israel. And there was this shepherd boy called David who stood and said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistines who has defied the army of God? Today your head will be cut short. Hallelujah. Amen. I am here. I'm standing under the anointing of my father, Pastor Kule Ibitayo, to prophesy to ten lives. Anyone that is terrifying your life in your father's house, any man that stands as a strong man, terrifying your life, terrifying the life of your children, today their head will be cut short in Jesus' name. If you believe, shout hallelujah! Hallelujah. Can we celebrate Jesus one more time? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand against the Lord. No one can. No one weep. Who can stand against the King? No one can. No one weep. Oh. Victory belongs to me. Oh, 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 victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to me. Who can stand against the Lord?
for you and you shall hold your peace. Victory belong to oh.
all about this baby. We called you. We call you your name we appreciate you we give you glory Lord we give you honor we give you adoration oh Lord blessed be your name blessed be your name blessed be your name Lord indeed you are the miracle worker you are the promise keeper father you are the light in the darkness we give you glory this day. We magnify you. We adore you, Lord. Lord, we invite you into this meeting this morning. It's your meeting. It's your program. It is your service. Father, have your way this morning in Jesus' name. Lord, we yield ourselves unto you. Manifest your power through us this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, prove your almightiness in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, for everyone that is under the sound of my voice this morning, make our life a showcase in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Make us a masterpiece in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we ask that you send your word again this morning. Send it with accuracy in the mighty name of Jesus. Send it with precision in the mighty name of Jesus. The word of the moment, the word of the season. The word of liberation, the word of deliverance. Father, the word of healing. Send to us this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Today is tagged perfected victory. Father, nothing short of perfection in our lives. In every area in every department, in all ramifications, in our lives, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Holy Spirit, take your place right now. I yield myself to you. I will not be an hindrance to your flow. And I hide myself behind the cross. Only you shall be seen this morning. Take all the glory. For in Jesus' mighty and precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Let somebody shout, Hallelujah! Let somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody that is ready for an encounter this morning, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Before you take your seat, we are going to pray just one prayer. Hallelujah. God bless you, choir. You can go back to your seat. Now, today is the 20th day of our fast. And the Lord said, I have not called the seed of Jacob to seek me in vain. And that is why we are going to pray this prayer this morning. And the prayer is that, Father, I will not go empty-handed. Now, there are certain things that you have been praying about. There are certain things that you need and you are not even aware of. There are certain issues that are ahead of you that you are not even aware of. There are certain dangers that are ahead that the devil is planning. There are certain conspiracies that the enemies are planning that you are not even aware of. But when you pray that prayer, God knows that area of your life that you have a need, that he knows that this particular thing, even though you have not asked. Because the Bible says we don't know how to pray. It is the spirit that helps our infirmity. So probably you have been praying amiss. Probably there are certain things that are important that you are not even giving attention to. By, by reason of that prayer this morning, the Lord is going to fix every one of them in the mighty name of Jesus. So you are going to open your mouth and say, Father, Father I will not leave this service empty-handed. I will not seek you in vain. 
in the name of Jesus. I will not wait in vain. I will not fast in vain in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I will not finish this. I, I will not wait in vain, O oh Lord. I will not finish this fast with, until you have done what you have, want to do in the mighty name of Jesus. That which you are proposed to do. Father, today shall, it shall be accomplished in my life. In the mighty name of Jesus, it shall be accomplished in my life. In the mighty name of Jesus, it shall be accomplished in my life. In the mighty name of Jesus, it shall be accomplished in my life. In the mighty name of Jesus, it shall be accomplished in my life. In the name of Jesus, Father, don't allow me to go empty handed. Father, don't allow me to go empty handed. I've come to seek you this morning. I've come to find you this morning. I've come to fellowship with you this morning. I've come to locate you this morning. Lord, meet me at the very point of my needs. In the name of Jesus. Meet me at the very point of my needs. In the name of Jesus. Meet me at the very point of my needs. In the name of Jesus. Meet me at the very point of my needs. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jehovah. Blessed be your name, O Lord. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are praying, as we have declared, so shall it be unto you, in Jesus' mighty name. The Lord bless you. Please be seated. Amen. Help me welcome your neighbor to the right and on the left. Welcome them to church. It's a good thing to see you in church this morning. It's a beautiful thing to see you in church. Amen. The Lord bless you. Amen. Ask them how is the fast going. One day to go. And in case you have not started, well, you can still start tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. It's a good thing to fast. Medically, it is good. And uh, spiritually, it is fantabulous. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Um, before we go into the word, I want us to watch a, a small clip. Um, multimedia, are you ready for us? There's a, there's a short clip. I mean, a short clip. I want us to watch, and I want us to listen. I'm sure some of us might have seen this, but there's a reason why I'm bringing it up, so that for the old church to see, you know, it actually resonates with what we are doing in the Bible study. But um, just listen to it, then we will take it from there. All right, guys. I've never really done anything like this before, but I feel like there's a huge problem among my fellow believers that really needs to be addressed here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jacob Dufour, and I'm a Christian filmmaker. I recently joined several large Christian groups on Facebook to help promote my company's movies. As I began seeing other posts on the group, I noticed that most of them said things like, Comment Amen for Jesus, Keep Scrolling for Satan, or If you comment Amen, God will bless you with such and such, and that kind of garbage. And I thought to myself, this is a group of hundreds of thousands of people who profess to be Christians. Let's see how many are actually serious about it. So I decided to do something a little controversial, and if I was wrong in any way for doing it, I sincerely apologize. But I decided to do a little experiment. So I posted Luke 4-7 in the group along with the caption, Comment Amen if you agree. For those of you who don't know the verse by heart, Luke 4-7 says, If you worship me, all will be yours. Which at first seems like a pretty inspirational quote, until you realize it's being said by Satan as he's tempting Jesus. After one minute of it being posted, I had five amens. Within the hour, I had over a hundred. As of the time of me saying this, the post has 666 likes, found that kind of ironic, and 576 comments. Out of those comments, only 20 people corrected me. That's 3.5%. 3.5. Almost 97% of the comments from supposed Christians were in agreement with something straight out of the devil's mouth simply because they sounded nice and were taken out of context. This is what's wrong with Christianity, guys. You know what 97% looks like on a chart? It looks like this. That's how many professing Christians did not take the time to learn what the Bible said or to at least fact check me before commenting. And it wasn't just your everyday believers commenting either. One amen in particular, which has since been deleted, but not before I screenshotted it, was by a man whose account name was So-and-So Pastor. Now, I just wanted to make sure that his last name wasn't Pastor or anything, so I commented, Are you a pastor? Yes, he said. Do you realize who is speaking in this passage? Yes, our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus. A man who calls himself an overseer of God's church, 
an elder, a, a, a leader, is completely ignorant not only to who said this, but to the entire gospel of Jesus Christ and the entire reason that Jesus did what he did in the first place. Some other comments. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and hallelujah. Amen, Lord. Thank you for everything you do for me and my family members. All my desires will be my possession. What? What do people think Christianity is? Jesus died so that we could be rich? So that life could be easy? No. Jesus died so that we could have eternal salvation. Anyone who thinks they'll be rewarded materially because they decided to follow Jesus is in for a big surprise because that ain't what it's all about. That's a bunch of prosperity gospel nonsense. It's false teaching, and it's taken right out of Satan's mouth in Luke 4-7. Read your Bible, guys. Know what it's about. Understand that there is false doctrine out there, and apparently 97% of us fall for it. 2 Timothy 4 says that for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. That's exactly what's happened, to the point that most of us don't even care enough about the truth to open our Bibles or to go on a Bible website to read it for ourselves. We just hear something, and if it sounds good, then we believe it. And that has to stop. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The Bible is important. Our salvation depends on our understanding of this book. We have to understand that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died a horrible, painful death, and rose again so that by following him we could have eternal life in heaven. That's it. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, how many of us have seen this video? All right. Now, the reason why I brought it up, you can, let's have the light on. Um, we're going into the message shortly. The reason why I brought this up is because, you know, for quite some time now, we have been talking about walk in the spirit. That's a topic we've been discussing in the Bible study. And the previous week we spoke about um, sorcery, and last week we discussed heresy. Now, um, after we discussed sorcery, I saw a post in one of our posts, the platform. Somebody sent something that tell 25 people that Jesus is the Son of God and your wish will come to pass in three days. And I was really, really, really upset. Because we have just discussed sorcery. Why would somebody, on what basis will Jesus give you your wish because you posted Jesus is the Son of God to 25 people. Now, as believers, we need to understand, we need to operate from the angle of knowledge. And you, you can see what, and many a times, you see th people who send things to you, and you don't even understand, number one, you forward it, number two, you say amen. Whether you are glorifying the devil, you don't know. Whether you are cursing yourself, you don't know. Whether you are pronouncing the, you know, you don't even understand what you are doing. And the truth is, you cannot be a part-time Christian and, 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 and conquer a full-time devil. That is the truth. If you, are, you want to be a believer, please be a believer. That is it. Because so many things are happening around. And we need to understand what we stand for as believers. And of course, it's part of what we're going to be talking about today. So if, you have, if you, have, you have that attitude or you have that habit of receiving something and just pushing it out or saying amen without you understanding what it, it's all about, then you still have a long way to go. We should come to that level of sitting down and studying the word of God. That's what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture are given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for instruction in righteousness. So everything that you need is in the word of God. I pray the Lord will give us understanding in Jesus' name. And for as many that still follow that, you say amen and money will come into your house. You say this and um, you jam a lock and you know all manner of craps. Please, you have to be born again today. Amen. The Lord will bless you mightily in Jesus' name. Now, the topic before us is perfected victory. And our text is taken from John chapter 16, verse 33. We're going to be reading from the Amplified Version, John chapter 16, verse 33. 
I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. In the world, you have tribulation and distress and suffering. But be, be courageous, be confident, be undoubted, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished. My victory is abiding. Amen. We're going to read that scripture together. I hope we, are, we can all see it, right? From the projector, from the TV. Now, one to go. I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. In the world, you have tribulation and distress and suffering. But be courageous, be confident, be undoubted, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished. My victory is abiding. Say to yourself, my conquest is accomplished. My victory is abiding. My victory is perfected. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now, a careful look at this passage shows that it is actually in two parts. There's a part, the first part here, you may want to call it part A, talks about tribulation, distress, and suffering. Hallelujah. Now, that is why the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the Bible says, and we know that we have God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. The entire world lieth in wickedness. Psalm 74, verse 20 says, have respect for your covenant, O Lord, for the dark places of the heart is full of habitation of cruelty. Now, what does that mean? It means that cruelty is not limited to your village. Even though you ran away from your village, the village which is a wizard, you run to another country, there is cruelty there. There is wickedness there. So cruelty is not peculiar to Africa. If there are no witches and wizards, they won't have an English name for it. It will have been your local name alone. Hallelujah. So there are demons that are sophisticated. There are demons that wear suits. There are demons that, that, that wear gown. There are demons. So don't be deceived that the demon will come with one on and one nasty looking face and whatever. Hallelujah. So they are everywhere. And that's why the evidence was in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Paul said in his letter to the Ephesians, he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in where? High places. Now, if this is what, is, what the world is characterized with, then what can we do? What is the next thing for us to do? The answer is in the second part of that scripture. That scripture that I read, John chapter 16 verse, can, can I have it again? John chapter 16 verse 33. Jesus said, but be courageous. Be confident. Be undoubted. Be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. That is the good news. He said, my conquest is accomplished. My victory is abiding. My conquest is accomplished. My victory is abiding. So that's another way to say, my victory is perfected. Please let me tell your neighbor. You'll be courageous. Be courageous. Because your victory is perfected. Because your conquest has been accomplished. And that same victory is abiding in the mighty name of Jesus. Now this particular statement is further elaborated in John chapter 19 verse 30. When the Bible says Jesus gave up. Jesus said it is finished. He bowed down his head and he gave up the ghost. Now what is it that it is finished? That means what I came to do, I have accomplished. The victory that I came to acquire for you, I have acquired it, I have accomplished my conquest, and I have handed it over to you. Now, there's another good news in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even what? Our faith. So that tells me that there is something fundamental about our faith as far as your victory is concerned. And please, I want you to understand something, that the devil, our hack enemy, is not a gentleman. And the only language you understand is the language of force. And he's never tired. I remember some two, three years ago, our last son, he asked me, he said, I think it was about, three, about four or five years old then, he said, Daddy, when the devil is bored, what does he do? 
I said, my dear, the devil is never bored. He's never bored because what the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant. Said your adversary, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So he's looking for careless Christians. He's looking for careless believers. The one that will be sleeping when he's supposed to be praying. The one that will be eating when he's supposed to be fasting. The one that will be taking a walk when he's supposed to be at the war front so that he can afflict them, so that he can cause them to stumble. So the devil is never tired. He's on full-time basis. So that's why you cannot afford to be on part-time basis. Because you're a child of God, you're an army, you're a soldier in the army of God. Hallelujah. And that's why the Bible tells us in Matthew eleven twelve. 12, it says, from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of God suffered violence, and the violence they take it by force. So the kingdom of God, from that period till today, today is the 19th of July, 2018, the kingdom of God suffers violence. Tomorrow is 20th of July, 2018, this, the kingdom of God suffers violence. If the Lord tarries, the 31st of this month, the kingdom of God does what? Suffers violence. So every day of our life, you have that understanding that you are in a battlefield. You may not like it, you may not like to hear that, but that is the truth. Every blessed day, we are in a battlefield. So what the devil understands is the language of violence. And you must learn to use your mouth to speak. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, Isaiah 54, verse 17, the Bible says, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. But the aspect that I'm actually interested in, it says, every tongue that rises against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. So you have a duty, you have a responsibility of condemning every tongue. When somebody says something that is not for you, immediately you return back to sender. When somebody says somebody say something that is not meant for you, somebody lays a curse on you, immediately you fire back with greater intensity. With more scriptures. Hallelujah. And you know the, the interesting thing about this scripture, I just suddenly discovered that this Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, Something similar happened in, second, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 54. You remember the story of David and Goliath. Now, the Bible says that, maybe if you read verse 45 or so, the Bible says that the Philistine cursed David with his own gods. And David did what? He also gave it, gave it back to him. Full measure, pressed down, shake it together, and running over. He said to him, today... Your head, I'm going to chop it off your neck. And you know, if you read, go to verse 54, the Bible says he took the head of the Philistine in his hand. So in other words, the tongue that rose against him, that he condemned, he had a proof in verse 54. So every time you shut your mouth, you are shutting your destiny. And every time you speak, you are releasing word. Jesus said to them, they did let our prophet not the, the spirit give it life. The word that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. John chapter 6 verse 63. They are spirit. So if they are spirit and they are life, that means they have the capacity to produce, they have the capacity to reproduce, they have the capacity to move around, they have the capacity to accomplish whatever they are sent to accomplish. And that's why the Bible says, the, none of my word will return back to me without accomplishing the purpose for which he has, it, I, I have sent it. You remember the, our elementary science, characteristics of living things. They must be able to reproduce. They must be able to move around. So if the word of God will not accomplish what he has sent it to accomplish until it comes back, so that means the word of God can move around. So if the word is released, it can locate the person. That's the meaning. And that is why you don't joke with words. Some people are so careless, they say certain things to their, even to their own children. Out of anger. They say, well, I didn't really mean it. But you have said it. And as a parent, your, your word is powerful. Because you have authority over that child. So if, it does not matter how angry you are. The best you can do for yourself is just to keep quiet. And if you must talk, bless instead of curse. If you must talk. Some people, their mouth is not bridled. They, if they don't talk, I mean, it will be a problem. In fact, it will be more chaotic for them. So if you must talk, say good things. Things are edifying. Praise the name of the Lord. And that also tells me that in, your, in the affairs of your life, 
you have a role to play. You are a catalyst. We discussed catalyst last week. We said they speed up chemical reaction. They make things to happen. They increase the rate. And whereas they, do not, they don't change, they don't change state, they don't have any permanent chemical change, as it were. But they have a role to play. So in your own matter, you are a catalyst. Please let me tell your neighbor, you are a catalyst. A catalyst. Say it, you are a catalyst. The pastor says you are a catalyst. Amen. After the service, come and challenge me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, the Bible says whatsoever is born of God. First, first John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Whatsoever. So as, as long as you have that tag on you, as long as you have that appellation on you, as long as you, have that, you bear that surname, that I'm a child of God, then you are an overcomer. If you are genuinely born again, if truly you are a child of God, then you are an overcomer. Hallelujah. And he says, the victory that overcomes the world is what? Is our faith. So I'm going to dwell a little on faith before we move on, discuss one or two things, then I'll be out of your way. Now, what is faith? Faith, number one, faith is acting on God's word. Acting on God's word or God's instruction. For instance, leave your father's house, leave your kindred, go to a place, a land I'm, I'm going to show you, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, God speaking to Abraham. That is faith. They say a fool at 40 is a fool forever. Abraham must have been a fool at 70. You know? So if a fool at 40 is a fool forever, then a fool at 70 is a fool for eternity. <laughs> but we can see the foolishness today. There are some foolishness that pays off. So if that relationship, if it's God that told you to go into that relationship, every other person may be against you. But as long as you know that it's God that is leading you, please go ahead. If God was the one that asked you to come to Dubai, even though you might not have gotten a job yet, your visa is running out, you have seven days to go, you have three days to go, even you have one day to go. We had a testimony of one brother that was at the airport and he got a job. He was already on his way back home. And somebody that did an interview for him, about some two, three months before then. Well, not three months, less than three months because it was just in between that window. He was wearing the same shirt he wore for the interview and he saw him at the airport. Are you not the one that interviewed sometime? He goes, yes. What happened? They didn't give you the job. I didn't get the job. Oh, okay, then we're supposed to get, give you the job. Come and see me. And that was how the man left the airport again and he went and he picked the job. So it does not matter what is happening around you. If God is involved in your matter, please go and sleep. Hallelujah. So faith is acting on God's instruction. You have seen something in the word of God. You know that this word is for you. You have a witness within you. It has been impressed upon you that this word is for you. Please hold on to it. That is faith. You may not see it. You may not, it may not look like it. You may be the odd one out. As a matter of fact, most of the time it's not popular. That is when it is faith. Number two, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not in according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. You have not seen it, but you believe it. You are called barren, and God says you are a father of nations. That is faith. You don't have a job today, and God says you are an employer of labor, even in this land of Dubai. That is faith. Because you are holding on to your God. Number three, it is the substance of, okay, I said it is the substance of things so forth. It is the channel of blessing. It is the channel of good report, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2. It says, through it, the elders of old, they obtained good report. Let's have Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2. Say, for by it, the elders obtain a good report. So you, you are looking for a good report, then you need to cling on to faith. Faith will help you. Faith will deliver a good report to you. Hallelujah. And also, faith is the currency of the kingdom. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So you, you, can, you can't please him. If you can't please God, then you, God does not, you don't have his ears. 
That's it. That means it does not matter how rich you are, as long as you don't have the local currency, you know, local currency, quote and unquote, because there are some currencies that are more powerful than the local currency where you are. If you come to my country now, you don't have Naira, you have dollars, you are a celebrity. Hallelujah. In fact, you prefer, they prefer to have it in dollars anyway. But I'm talking about you, you don't have access and you cannot change and you cannot transact business. That is what faith is. Maybe let me put it in a better context. Faith is your Emirates ID. In Dubai, even I discovered now lately that you want to buy fuel now, they're asking for Emirates ID. You go to the bank, you, they ask for Emirates. So that means practically you are grounded if you don't have Emirates ID. There's little or nothing that you can do. So that is what faith is. So in this kingdom, if you are going to amount to anything at all, if you are going to take delivery of that which belongs to you, that which the Lord has given to you, then you must be a companion of faith. There must be a relationship between you and faith. Now let's consider quickly some boosters of faith. Three of them. Then we'll look at two people that missed their perfected victory and um, one or two things in our close. Now, number one is there must be a constant touch with the word of God. There must be a constant touch with the word of God. You can only know the mind of God via his word. If you are not in agreement with the word of God, then if you are not, you are, you are not the type that give yourself to study, then you can't know the mind of God. That man was asking him, you said you are a pastor. Do you know who is speaking in that? Yeah, he's our Lord Jesus Christ. That means he doesn't know. That was a commercial disgrace. He's not even aware. Online disgrace that he gave himself to the whole world. If he knew, I mean, he will have caution. How about those other 20 people that saw it, that knew what this guy was talking about? It's either they knew the scripture or they took the pain of, okay, let me even see what this guy is talking about. And that is the problem we have today in the Christian dorm. We have a, a bunch of lazy believers. We are not ready to do anything. Everything is about microwave. Let's do it. The service is even taking long. I'm, ask him where he's going. I just want to go. I just want to go. I, I mean. And this is the platform for you to, to learn. I was talking to the people that were at the Bible study on Tuesday. We do, it's only during you know, sessions like this that we can actually grow. That is the truth. We come on Friday. Friday is everybody's service. Every Friday is evangelistic service. It's celebration service. Yeah. We can't do so much. But during Bible study, sometimes we want to close. We cannot close. Sometimes I force that we have to close now. Because people are asking questions. Sometimes we ask questions that are not even related to what we are discussing. That's an opportunity for us to discuss it. The Bible says, iron sharpened iron. A man sharpened the continents of his friend. So when we don't have such platform, and that is the reason why we have all of these things. So it is important for us to settle down with the word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. It is what you hear that makes you. Where, where do you think fear comes from? Fear comes from what you see, from what you hear. That, they said that in that particular country, they are bombed everywhere even though you have not been here, maybe it's a fraction of the, a, a, just a portion of the country that, you know, was attacked. But because you heard it, I said, oh, me, I'm not going there. You know? Imagine if it was something good that you heard about it. Ah, I want to go to that Dubai. There, there's no job there, I know. But let me also go there. Even though there's no job, let me also go and join them. and be looking for the job. Why? Because they heard that in Dubai, every, you, they pick money on the streets. So what you, you have to give attention to what you hear, what you listen to. And that's why you don't watch. It's not everything that you watch. It's not everything that you listen to. Some people have that. They have that they, they take in a lot of junks. So at the end of the day, when they sleep at night, masquerade is pursuing them. Snake is biting them. This one is, monkey is punching them. Because they just watched snake in the monkey shadow before they slept. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, the Lord said to Joshua, said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. You shall meditate therein day and night to do and to observe according to all that is in it therein. Now that is when you make your way prosperous and when you have good success. 
God encouraged Joshua, be strong, be courageous, be strong. And he told him, this is what he gave to him. He said, this thing, I have given it to you. It must not depart. How to... So read it, digest it, ingest it, do everything about it. Regurgitate. So you can't do much without the word. Because that is where you know the mind of God. In John chapter 6, verse 63, when Jesus said, the word I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. When you read the, let, let, the latter part of it, I think from verse 65, you know, he asked them, the Bible says Jesus said, he said some things and because of that, some people turned back, they said, we are not going to follow you again. And he turned to the rest of them, he said, do you want to go also? And what did Peter say in verse 68? He said, there is nowhere for us to go. You have the word of eternal life. So if you don't follow you, that means an end has come to our lives. That's the meaning. So the amount of word that you ingest determines the level of your faith. That is when, when something happens, you remember the word of God. You had a bad dream. You wake up from that dream. What the word says is, I shall not die, but I shall live to declare the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. That is what the word says. You, it is what you have, and it is not what you, not the word that you kept under your pillow. And there's a place of meditation because when, it is, when you meditate, you move the word from your head, you move it to your heart. When certain things happen, you, you know there are certain things that will happen and you forget everything that you know. Because those things are in your head, but the things that are in your heart, you will never forget. They are part of you. That's why the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Not out of the abundance of the head. The head can go on sabbatical any time. Number two, we are talking about boosters of faith. Number two is prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting must be a lifestyle. It shouldn't be that the general verse has declared that we should fast for 21 days. Yes, I'm going to fast. And after this one now, until the next proclaim fast. No. If you are, that, if you are in that category, you are a part-time believer. There are more, you must have a day, minimum at least one day in the week that you fast, or a period in the month that you fast for yourself. For your family, for your future. Now, there, there's this mistake that some people make. When you see some people going to church, you know, going for prayer meeting and all that, you think they have problems. It's not everybody that goes to church that have problems, though. Some are going to church so that they will not have problems. Because every of your investment, every of your service is an investment. The day that you need it, you go there and withdraw and use the money. So the day when you go and pray, you go, you, you fast, you do all manner of things. The day that the, you know, the day that you are going to need it, it comes easily. Because you have sowed. Is it the day that you want to harvest that you go and plant? Suddenly you discover that you need a tuba of yam. You know, okay. Um, this morning I'll go and plant a, you know, I'll plant yam then by evening, I'll go and harvest. Maybe you, you go and harvest rubber yam. Because there, there is rubber rice, rubber everything now, rubber, rubber egg. So maybe there is rubber yam too. In Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, verse 2 and 14, the Bible says Jesus was led, this thing is off, Jesus was led by the Spirit to go into the wilderness and to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. For those periods, he was not eating, he didn't eat anything. Hallelujah. And in verse 14, the Bible says he returned in the power of the Spirit and his fame went abroad. His ministry was announced. Amen. At that point, his faith will have risen. Even the faith of people around him will have also increased. Amen. So that is what prayer and fasting does. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, I said, Jesus said to them, I'll be it by this kind of thing that cannot go out except by prayer and fasting. They were with Jesus. They tried all manner of things. And don't forget that they already accused Jesus that your disciples are not fasting. These guys are not fasting. They are just eating. They are having pot belly. So they are not fasting like these disciples of John the Baptist. He said to them, as long as the groom is with them, they don't fast. But a time is coming when they will, the groom will be taken away and then they will fast. So that, I'm sure that miracle fell within the, the, the space of that time. 
So, and he told them, so you know, they told you they are, you are not fasting. Now, you know that you have to do what? Fast. Because this kind of a thing, you can't do it. Demons are also in levels, they are in categories. The same way anointings are in levels. Praise the name of the Lord. Number three, we are talking about the boosters of faith. Number three is the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 12, 9, the Bible says to another, faith by the same Spirit. By the same Holy Spirit. He gave them faith. So faith is a gift of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Then Jude chapter 1, verse 20, he says, Building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So you can build up your faith as you pray in the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says those, the person that speaks in the, in, in, in the Holy Spirit, I mean, that speak in tongues, speak mysteries. So as you are speaking mysteries, your faith is being boosted. You are communicating with the, with the heavenlies. You are not operating at a, at a lower frequency anymore. Amen. Amen. So it's important for us to give attention to these boosters. We don't have to have a long list. But let's do things that we can easily recollect, things that we can easily pick. Hallelujah. Don't forget, we are talking about perfected victory. So we are, I want to also discuss things that can erode perfected victory. And somebody is asking, is it possible for somebody to erode it? Or is it possible for somebody to miss it? Yes, absolutely. Even though it has been handed over to you, you can still miss, miss it. I want to quickly look at two individuals, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, you know, that bungled their own opportunities. It is my prayer that you, you will not miss it in Jesus' name. Now, the, the first person is Samson. You read Judges chapter 13 to 16, you see the story of Samson there. You know, the thing that surrounded his bath, and all that, and all that. But you understand that Samson was anointed from the womb. Judges chapter 13, verse 4. The, the angel that appeared to Manoah's wife told him, said, this, I mean, you're going to conceive, but be careful. Don't take any hard, don't take any alcohol, don't take any wine while you are still, or don't take any strong drink, or eat anything that is unclean. Because the person that you are carrying is a Nazarite. And in verse 5, he said to him that this, I mean, he said to her, that this man is going to be born a deliverer. So he has an assignment from heaven and it was well spelled out. He said, No razor shall come upon his head, for the child, the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So he had a, he has his job description before he was given birth to. And everybody knew it. Well, at least the father, the mother knew it. The parents. So there's nothing as good as somebody's destiny being, you know, settled even before he was given birth to. His ministry was close to that of the John the Baptist. There were not so many people that were announced, their birth were announced like this. Except maybe for him, John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ. Even the other great men that, that lived, their births were not announced. The only thing we knew about, about Anna was that the, she had a delay. And it was on purpose because God wanted the, that womb to bear Samuel. But Samuel's birth was, was not announced until, he went to, to Shil, until she went to Shiloh. So this man had a very unique and peculiar ministry. But for some reason, so you can call it perfected victory. Because he was supposed to deliver. And the Bible says every time, you know, he goes out, the Spirit of God will come upon him. Imagine one man, one single man, carrying the gate of the city, carrying it on the back, and, you know, he went like this, he went like this, and he went to a place, and he kept it there. So when the people of the city will come, say, ah, this is supposed to be the entrance of our city. No, he's here. They get confused. Because of one man. Even at the point, his own people, they bound him together. I think in chapter 15 or so, they bound him together and 
They handed him over to the Philistines. They said, okay, don't kill me. As long as you don't kill me, just tie me and hand me over. You know, they handed him over. And with a job of an ass, he killed 1,000 people. And I wonder what they were looking at. He killed the fourth, second, third, fourth, fifth. You know? He killed all of them. 1,000. Maybe that was when the other 2,000 advised themselves that way. If you don't go, this guy will kill all of us here. You know? Because he had an unusual anointing upon him. But at the end of the day, Samuel did what? He missed it. You will not miss your destiny in the mighty name of Jesus. The second person is Judas Iscariot. This man had a fantastic opportunity to sit with Jesus in heaven. With the other 12, or with the other 11, but because of 30 pieces of silver. And of course, the Bible says he has been stealing. And Jesus knew that he has been stealing. He left him alone. He has been stealing money from the purse until he stole and he stole and he stole. And maybe he finished the money by himself and discovered that there's nothing to sell. Okay, let's Kukuma sell this man. Let me convert him to cash so that, you know, full and final. And he missed it. In Acts chapter 1, verse 16, let's read Acts chapter 1, verse 16, 17, and 20. Peter rose up and he said, let this man's place be. He said, men and brethren, this scripture must need, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. You see, all of them knew that it was the one that, you know, that Pilate, those people that, you know, that, that came and um, to take, take Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Can you imagine? Don't forget that when Jesus sent them out in twos, they said they were casting out demo, demons and all that. It was part of them. Who, maybe it was part of the demons that he casted out that came to haunt him. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's go to verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishop prick, let another take. New King James says, his place, let somebody else take. So his place was declared vacant. This is somebody that was supposed to have, it was supposed to be, be celebrated here and in eternity. Double portion, he lost it. So it is very, very possible for, for one to lose it. We are talking about perfected victory. Yeah. It is very, very possible to lose it if care is not taken. So what are those factors that can make somebody to miss it? What are those factors that can erode perfected victory? Number one, I call it uncontrolled appetite. Uncontrolled appetite. Remember the man called Reuben. He lost his first position in Genesis chapter 49. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 22, the Bible says that he went into Bilhah, his father's concubine, that Jacob had it and he kept quiet. Until the very last day that he knew that he was going. And he said to him, you are my firstborn. You are the excellency of power, dignity. I, I can imagine him adjusting his jacket. That, okay, I want to take the first, you know, firstborn's portion. He said, thou shalt not excel. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. So he lost it. They must have been respecting him in the house. They must have been giving him honor. Our big brother, he this, this, that. But at the end of the day, he missed it. He lost his perfected victory that was supposed to be a perfected one. How about Esau? The Bible called him, the Bible talking about, he said in Hebrews chapter 16, verse 18, he says, let there be no, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, he said, let there be no profane person among you like Esau. Say, so let there be any fornicator or profane person as he saw, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. He also lost. Have you ever heard God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau before? He's supposed to be God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But because of one plate of maybe rice, or basmati, or parati, or whatever, that the biryani, whatever they gave him, he said, okay, take, you collect. You know? And he lost it forever. Forever till eternity. That's why the Bible, in New Testament, they call him a profane person. 
You know? That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. And the last person I want to talk about here, under uncontrolled appetite, is because, see, Reuben could have looked for another woman, no? but he went to look for an old woman. This woman is even older than him. Because it's, 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 the woman was supposed to be Leah, I mean, Rachel's maid. No other girl in town except your father's concubine. Then David, even though God had mercy on him, but the Bible said there was a pronouncement of him. He said, the sword will not depart from your house. What was his offense? When others were going, when other kings were going to war, he stood at home. He was watching pornography. He went on the, on the wall. Is that not pornography that he watched? From pornography to adultery, from adultery to murder. So if you are there, you still indulge in that sin. Nobody is your laptop, is your phone. You are watching what you are not supposed to watch. Be careful. God is watching you. Okay, so that you will not commit murder. God said to him, it was a shameful thing. He said, I'm going to give your own wife to your neighbor. And it's so bad that it was even his son that slept with his own concubine in the face of the son. And that is why when you, do, when you indulge in certain things, the, you know there's an adage in my place that this, the scar cannot be like the skin. Even though it has healed up, but everybody that sees it will ask you, what happened to you here? Then you start explaining. It's because I killed Uriah's wife. And, I, mean, I, mean, I, I killed Uriah. I took his wife and uh, this and that. Even when Nathan went to him, he said, that man must die. You know, he proclaimed judgment without knowing that he was the... The culprit. Number two, doubt or unbelief. James chapter 1, verse 7 to 8 says, For let not that man think he shall receive anything from God. James chapter 1, verse 7 to 8. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double minded man is unstable. He's like Reuben. Because no? the same thing that Jacob said to him, that you are as unstable as waters. So them, that man cannot receive anything from the Lord. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 15, the Bible says, Jesus could not do many mighty works. He did, he, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The Messiah, the anointed, he couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief. So if you don't believe, then perfected victory may not be able to land in your hand. And that is where faith comes in. Because what you don't, what you don't confront, you, you may not be able to conquer. And you need faith. Praise the name of the Lord. Then the last one is sin. In Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2 from verse 5, remember the story of that man that was sick of palsy that his four friends took to Jesus. The Bible said Jesus saw their faith and he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven. Now, he saw their faith, he forgave their sin. If I may forgive his sin. Why? Because he knows that this sin can corrupt their faith. When he saw their faith, he quickly forgave the sin. You remember the man also that was sick for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. In verse 14, the Bible says that Jesus saw him in the temple. And what did he tell him? He said, go and sin no more. Lest the worst thing come upon you. So there's a relationship between sin and sickness. Now I'm not saying that every sickness, I mean, everyone that is sick is a sinner. No. But every sin, I mean, every sickness has, I mean, every sin, every sickness has a root in sin. No, what I'm, no. Every sinner, every sickness does not come from sin. If you, are, if you are sick, it does not mean that you are a sinner. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. If you are sick, it doesn't mean that you are a sinner. But when there is sickness, sickness has its original root in sin because it's from the devil. Praise the name of the Lord. So it's important for us to be able to differentiate all of these things. These are things that, can, that are responsible for eroding that which the Lord has prepared for us. And as I round off, as I close, I know that the Lord is going to heal somebody here this morning in the name of Jesus. Because that is part of what, what the Lord has said to us that is going to heal this morning. Now in Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 23, Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 23, the, Bible, the Lord asks a question. They say, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Say, why then is the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? 
So that means God was surprised that his people were sick. And in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, he said they were, I, he was wounded for our sin, he was brought for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. And I want you to note something that the healing here is in the past tense. Just like perfected victory is in the past tense. That means it is finished, it is completed, according to John chapter 19, verse 30. It is accomplished. Don't forget when we, what we read in John chapter 16, verse 33. Say, my victory is abiding. I have accomplished it. Praise the name of the Lord. And in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17b, he said, For he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. That one also is in the past tense. He had already taken it. So if he has taken it, it is not supposed to be there. So that should help our faith. Because you need faith to be healed. That's why sometimes Jesus will ask them, do you believe I can heal you? Imagine that person says, no, I don't believe. Then you think Jesus will force himself on him? No. That's why the scripture we read in Matthew 13 verse 58. He couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief. So it's straightforward. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24, he said, by whose stripes ye were healed. So, as far as your health is concerned, you have perfected victory. That is the good news this morning. Amen. As far as your health is concerned, you have perfected victory. Amen. Whatever area of your body that is healing, whatever part of you, whether it is spiritual sickness or a physical sickness or an emotional sickness, today the Lord is going to heal you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And you know something as I close. Healing is as easy as forgiveness of sin. Jesus said to that man, the man sick of palsy, he said, your sins will be forgiven you. And then when you read Psalm 103 verse 3, he said, he forgiveth all our iniquities, he healed all our diseases. So that means the same way it's easy for him to forgive all your iniquities, the same way it is easy for him to heal all your diseases. If only you believe and you will come to him. Rise on your feet. Amen. We're going to be praying. I have one, some few prayer points here that we're going to pray. But before we go into that, I want to give opportunity to some people here this morning. Because, well, I hope we have time to do that. We should be able to do that. We'll be laying hands on as many that are sick, you know, just briefly. We pray for them and um, you receive your healing in the mighty name of Jesus. But before we, we go into all of that, all eyes closed, all eyes bow. There are some people that here this morning that I want to pray for, this afternoon that I want to pray for. You, you have been able, you are, now you understand the rule of sickness, or the rule of sin in sickness. And you, you are there, you want God to forgive your sins. You are saying, I want to have a relationship with God. Maybe you had a relationship with him before. And somehow, things went bad, you went somewhere, you tried some other things. Now you discover that there is no other God except this true God. And you are saying, I want to come back home like the prodigal son. I'd like to pray for you this morning. And maybe also that you want to, you just you know that you don't have a relationship with God and you want to give your life to Jesus. Can I also see your hand up very quickly so that I can pray with you before we go into some other things that we are going to do. God bless you for those hands. You are lifting your hand unto God, not unto any man. It's about you and your God. Not about the person standing beside you. Not about the person that invited you to church. It's an individual race. It's a personal race. On that day, you are going to stand before your maker. It's going to, you are going to give account. Today, we are talking about rapture during the Bible study, mean, the Friday school. It, 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 it's an individual race. Nobody is going to answer for you. Your pastor cannot answer for you. Your pastor will answer for himself. Your wife cannot answer for you. Your husband cannot answer for you. It's a personal race. So you are there. You want to give your life to Jesus. Let me see your hand up very quickly. Or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Or maybe you don't even know where you stand. I also need to pray for you very quickly. We are running out of time because we are going to pray. And if you don't settle the aspect of sin first, you don't settle your relationship with him first, then there is nothing that can happen. Jesus said to that woman, the food that is meant for children cannot be given to dogs. So as long as you are not in the fold, then you are not regarded as a child. You are simply regarded as a dog. So you are there, you want to give your life to Jesus. Can I just see your hand up very quickly? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Some years ago, I also did the same thing. And from that period, the Lord has been good to us. He has been taking care of us. He has been nurturing us, moving us from one, one level to another. 
you are there, you are still struggling with yourself. I mean, this message is for you. Today is your day. Don't go back home with that sickness. Don't go back home with that challenge. Don't go back home with that problem. He has bought that victory for you. And the only thing, one of the things that can hinder you is sin. Uncontrolled appetite. Maybe you have some habits. Maybe you have some addiction. Maybe you're involved in some one or two other things. Maybe you are there, you, you are into masturbation, you are into you are to all kinds of unrighteousness. You are saying, today marks their end. Devil, I don't want to have anything to do with you again. You are, you, are the, you are the person I'm talking to. Let me see you very quickly so that I can pray for you before we go into the general prayer. Amen. God bless you for those hands. God bless you for those hands. God bless you for those hands. You are lifting them unto God. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. It is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. First to the Jews, then to the Greek. You are there, you don't want to be ashamed. If you are ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of you. This is the day that the Lord has made. It does not matter the number of years you have been coming to church. Probably they even give birth to you in the church. The, today is your day. Today is your day. Today is your day. Please lift up those hands. Lift them up unto heaven. Now, if you have been given a card, I want you to just put your hand on your chest. Put, one, put the hand that you have the card, put it on your chest and lift up the other one to heaven. Put one on your chest and lift up the other one to heaven. And say after me, Lord Jesus, come into my life today. I believe you came to this world to die for me. And on the third day you rose again. Please write my name in the book of life. I am born again in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, please come forward. I want to pray for you personally here. Please come forward. You pray, you pray that prayer. Please come forward very quickly. God bless you. God bless you. Church, let's put our hands together for the Lord. Sin is a destroyer. Sin is a destroyer. It was sin that sank Samson, a man that had a glorious destiny. It was sin that destroyed his, he destroyed his life, he destroyed his ministry, he destroyed his destiny. Sin is not something that you toy with if you don't want to become a toy in the hand of the enemy. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, we bless your name for this day. Thank you for your children that you have called unto yourself. According to your word, no man come except you draw. Thank you, Father, for drawing these ones unto yourself. Glory be to your name in the name of Jesus. Lord, because they have confessed you before men, Father, confess them before your Father in the name of Jesus. The same grace that has brought them, let that grace preserve them in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for them that they will not go back to sin in the mighty name of Jesus. And from this moment onward, let there be a turning point in their lives in the name of Jesus. Everything that has tormented them before now, today marks their hand in the mighty name of Jesus. No more affliction in your life. No more oppression in your life in the name of Jesus. No more suffering for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Your victory is perfected today in the mighty name of Jesus. So shall it be. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. I want you to go with my sister. She will take your details at the back. While we are praying, I want you to also pray along with us. And after that, you come back and join us. Please go with her. God bless you, church. Let's put our hands together. Amen. I'm really, really out of time. But we are still going to pray. We are going to pray. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 17. The Bible says, I will restore health unto you and heal your wounds. That is the word of the Lord. We are going to pray and say, Father, in whatever area, in, in whatever area my health is healing, in whatever area my health is healing, let there be total restoration today in the mighty name of Jesus and heal my wound in the name of Jesus. Father, in whatever area my health is healing, let there be total restoration today in Jesus' name, and heal every wound. Every spiritual wound, Father, heal. Every emotional wound, Father, heal in the name of Jesus. Every psychological wound, Father, heal in the name of Jesus. Every heart, Father, heal.